Welcome to the I Now Pronounce You Divorced podcast, where we have three award-winning family law attorneys dive into intriguing topics like divorce, military divorce, custody and visitation, trust and estate planning, and all things family law. Join us as we provide a comprehensive viewpoint through the eyes of our experts and guests aiming to educate and soothe our listeners. Get ready to tune in because I Now Pronounce You Divorced starts right now. Hi, welcome back to I Now Pronounce You Divorce. Uh, last week, we were joined by uh, Josephia to talk about going back to school, and she was doing a wonderful job explaining to us all the time that it takes. You know, this you, you come in with an issue right in front of your face, but there's so much more to think about. And I cut off Dan, so in, in all fairness, I told him I let him start this week. So Dan, uh, go ahead. Thanks. Uh, I, one of the things I was thinking about when you were uh, talking on the last episode, when you're you know, having a plan and clients coming in with concerns. I think the best part, and I want your thoughts on this in order to validate or substantiate and go in front of the judge, and as you say, so we don't embarrass ourselves, because I definitely don't need any help with that, right? That just sometimes <laughs> comes naturally. So I always want to speak to clients. What do you have as far as documentation? Show me kind of the proof that you think you have so I can walk you through that and then we can come up with the plan. But I'd be interested to see what your thoughts are on, on documentation and what, what type of documentation do you look for? So when we're looking at, um, and I go back to the uh, example that we talked about last week, um, where we have some short term issues versus long term issues, I remind clients all the time and I remind, you know, everyone again of the importance of that person's particular situation. So I am looking for your schedule. What is the day to day life of this child? That's the only in my jurisdictions. The only thing that the court cares about is what does this child life look like day to day, right? So what are extracurriculars? What's the school schedule? How far are you away from school? What's the commute, um, you know, between each party? And so we're going to be looking at things like Google map um, um, directions at the, the peak time of school time in the morning, the peak time of school time in the afternoon. Uh, we're looking at things like text messages, communications between mom and dad about pick up and drop offs how many times um has a spouse have to ask for assistance where they're not able to utilize their pick up and drop off time i am just looking to see what your life looks like and so yes we automatically ask for the last year of text messages between spouses if a child is old enough the last year of text messages between um a child and both parents uh, we look at the medical records who's been taking the child to the doctor who's been taking the child to their um, field day at school, who's been going to PTA meetings, who's been taking the child to the IEP meetings. And, and again, when we talk about children who have issues with autism, who asks the questions to the IEP teacher, who connects the IEP teacher to the doctor, who connects the IEP teacher to the mental health professional, right? Uh, I wanna remind everyone that what's relevant is not in the, in the evidence that we look at once we build that foundation, we are looking at what is in dispute. So if one child, one mother or one father is saying, I, I spend more time, right? I do more things. As we were saying that last episode with the Navy SEAL, show me the, the money, right? Show me the evidence of exactly how are you taking care of this child? Because um, the evidence is in all of those communications. And so um, that's what we want to look at, right? Um, every case is going to be different because the amount of attention and um, love and care that some parents put on is different than other parents. I've seen it where um, one parent does everything. I've seen it where both parents do everything together jointly, which makes it a much harder decision for the court and for the judge. Um, and so any and everything that can distinguish you from the other parent is what you want to look for. Again, um, looking for things that you can Google or copy and paste, that's great for initial preparation. But when you're getting ready for a trial and settlement talks have, have ended, you need to look at what distinguishes you from the other parent. Mm -hmm. And just in your, in your other answers, it sounds like you've learned a lot about special needs and some mm -hmm. different conditions and some different issues that parents have been facing. Um, have you found that to be an increasing part of your practice in the past few years? I, I think so. I don't know if it, I don't know if you guys have seen it as well, 
um, yep. whether or not there have been just more diagnoses in general. Mm-hmm. I, you know, it's been a lot of, because the IEPs now cover a lot of different things, right? Not just autism. Um, it escapes me. What's the, the disorder when you're disruptive? Disruptive. ADHD. ADHD, but it's also the disruptive, uh, like just, I think it's, it's a new one that I've seen a lot when they just can't, it's not ADHD. I think it is a subgroup of ADHD. I, I apologize. Um, mm-hmm. But yes, I, I think I have been seeing it a lot more. Um, now that you mention it, <laughs> you mention it. Um, and I think that those and you know why probably when you think about it, Rebecca, is because those marriages are the most difficult ones. I mean, right. Especially if you have a parent that is always going to the doctor, taking the child to these uh, mental health appointments and um, tracking the progress of a child and not getting the support that they need. So yeah, I, I do, I have seen it. And I think that when they come, uh, from my experience, that's why they're one of the main reasons that they're getting a divorce is because they're just not getting the support that they need at home. Right. And I feel like most of our job in those cases mm-hmm. is actually educating the court about yeah. whatever the condition is, whatever the diagnosis is, whatever the needed therapies are, and sort of presenting that all together. Um, because most judges aren't necessarily that familiar with with what special needs are going to look like and they're going to be different case by case right just like you were talking about mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um and i think th- that's where the importance of the details of your case the details of your day-to-day life um they need to be laid out on the table in a way that does not overwhelm the, the court and that's relevant to the decision that needs to be made and so um when we go to the needs of that child um that's going to be paramount because especially if that child has had progress in your care, um, that is going to be one of the biggest factors that even a judge that is not as educated on those issues um, that you can easily show like, Hey, in my care, we have had progress because I have been doing these things when the minor child gets home. I have been uh, following up on the different um options that the, the doctors have given me or the IEP teacher, has, IEP teacher has given me to ensure that those things are happening for our child. So yeah, it's it's very important to look at what your situation in, in, is in in these cases. It is. And you know, I'm glad you brought up the, the embarrassment thing is, mm-hmm. you know, even though I usually tell clients, look, you hired me to tell you the law, I need you to tell me the facts. Yep. Um, but Neither one of us need to walk into court with you talking about facts of every time the child comes home and their underwear is dirty. Here's a pair of the dirty underwear, your judge. Um, we don't need to do that. You know, we, we need to be we need to understand the pomp and circumstance. Um, and, you know, the proof is in the pudding. Right. You know, like you're talking about, you, you brought up something. How did the child? How's the, the care of the child? How are the grades when there was somebody? You know, one of the pieces of advice I gave somebody one time, I said, just send a note to all of your child's teacher, letting them know what the new custody schedule is. Yeah, that's it. And guess what? The teachers knew. And I had these wonderful witnesses who showed up to court. And it was like every time I throw the other parent, they look tired. They're sleepy. They fall asleep in class. There's homework's not done. And they show up late to school. And, you know, like you said, we had to wait about six to eight months before we could do anything. But we had six to eight months of evidence. The proof was in the pudding yeah. there. And we walked into court and it wasn't just like, hey, my, my son tells me that he stays up too late at mom's house. It was teachers saying he falls asleep. He's more disruptive. Like he's not there at school. And when on these other weeks, he's got his homework done. He's perfectly rested and he actually performs very well. Um, yeah. So how do you talk to parents about not creating evidence, but using the tools available to them within the school system, the teachers, the, the bus schedule? just to get things that may exist, to back up their their feelings that the kids aren't getting there on time? The court considers more than anything else, I believe, the time period between when the divorce is filed Mm -hmm. and when the trial occurs. Because the the court is thinking, you're on your best behavior. Like, this is the time where anything you were going to do, you're going to do it now, at least Mm -hmm. the, the judges in my area. And when I'm presenting that to my client, You know, when we look at what life can look like after, um, I let everyone know you're not the person that makes the final decision on whether or not you're going to have primary custody or 50-50 custody schedule. 
So all of the issues and the concerns that you have, you need to lay it out on the line during this time frame, right? Don't try to be strategic and trying to show that you're the primary parent. Give them the rope that you know they're going to hang themselves on. So I love communications with the teachers because most teachers, they want you to, any, any parent that's communicating with the teacher, I'm going to tell you right now, they, they love you just off, off front because there are issues that are um, stopping their ability to handle their classroom, they're going to respond back. So nine times out of 10, when I've told my clients, communicate with the teacher, the medical professional, the therapist about the concerns, CC dad on it, advise the, the professional. These are the things that I think would be good for, for dad to do or mom to do and for I to do, right? And for me to do. Um, and have that conversation back and forth with those professionals in order to, again, with the plan or the end goal of you being able to have a vision in your mind, what would life look like if the court grant grants 50-50 or a schedule that I don't like? Let me get myself ready for that, right? Because I always advise, because it's such a long period of time, you need to be ready for either position, right? But in doing that, I will tell you that that's the best piece of advice because you're not trying to be strategic. You're just providing information. You are um, communicating your concerns. All of the concerns are being noted to all the professionals and they usually are going to respond back because in an attempt to not be involved in a court battle and to resolve all the issues that are in front of them and to give the other parent every opportunity to look like a good person, right? Because everyone wants to give each other the, the op professionals specifically who deal with these cases all the time, they want to give your other parent the opportunity to, to look like the good guy. So once you've given all of those opportunities and you know who this person is, and especially when we're talking about significant and serious um, disabilities or challenges that your child may have, that six to eight month period of time that's gone by and there's been no response or little response and or confusing and combative responses and or negligent responses, oh, I couldn't make the appointment because, oh, I could not do this because, or I, you know, I felt like you should have done more because you have had a neutral party to filter through, to provide neutral responses over a long period of time. Um, and so it's, it, it's become a point now, Charles, that I used to be more strategic and calling it gathering evidence. Um, but now I'm just like, give them the, the rope. Because when you present it that way, right, and you're already the parent that's doing it over that you've been doing it this entire time, um, the proof is in the pudding. Because someone can, I think, I feel like the first 30 to 60 days, people can put up a front. But after 60 days, it's, it's over. You're not going to be able to maintain. They're not going to be able to maintain it. They haven't been doing it and they don't plan on doing it. It's not going to happen. One of the things that you mentioned earlier that I thought should really resonate with a lot of practitioners that are, are listening is mm -hmm. being able to kind of walk the judge through your case. And, and mm -hmm. that's where I feel a lot of practitioners fall short, on, especially when I was really litigating, uh, that I would take advantage of hiring an expert. Whether or not I call them, they at least can aid me through this. And, and one of the many things that we pride ourselves on at the firm is when we mentor our attorneys and, and we do case discussion, so we want to identify an expert often and early because we want to make sure that we get the best, but also that that person can help us throughout the case as far as what we need to present. What are your thoughts on having an expert involved in and how many experts have you dealt with as far as, okay, if I have a, a child that has special needs, what type of expert would I need to get for, for that type of an issue? Or if I have parents who just can't really get along and, and maybe that's a high conflict, what type of expert do I need to get for that type of situation? Because I feel as, as others are listening in, you know, they, they may not know and they're they're just gravitating to what we offer as far as advice. And, and I think that's just so important because that really is going to make or break the case, in my opinion. I agree. Um, I agree, Dan. I've, I've worked with about 10. Um, I love to note them early. Um, I know that that is a cost prohibitive act. Right. But it's such a cornerstone and important cost um, that's going to bring forth evidence and information that the court is not just going to consider. So what happens is that you know your child well and the other parent knows your child well, right? So there's an opinion on this side and there's an opinion on that side. And just like your constitutional right to have custody of the minor child, the court has to look at outside information to um, 
tip the scales of justice, so to speak, right? Um, and an expert is an excellent way to do that. Um, experts specifically, they will go through the history of the medical records, the history of the mental health records. Um, and when I say medical records, I really, I think of literal medical records, right? The physical part of the body of the, the minor children, whereas mental health, I consider um, those um, mental health issues specifically, right? Um, and so that expert going through the life of your child, right? The impact of different um, therapies, the impact of different services that that child has gone through is a powerful piece of light into and, and vision into that child's life that the court can't get from mom and dad because mom and dad's perspective um, are on opposite ends of the spectrum. And so I believe that experts, and, and, and this is how, as you can tell, I explain it to my clients, right? An expert sits in the middle, right? I don't know you, I don't know you. I am looking at what this child has gone through and I'm looking at what's in the best interest of this minor child. And they're not even making a decision if it's dad or mom, right? And so the court, every time I have a good expert, right? Who's not tilted on one side or the other. They're in the middle. They're talking to the court about everything about this child, nothing about the parents. That court has a moment during a trial to not think about a mom or a dad, to get information fully about that minor child. And so what's so powerful about experts is that, and, and it, it, as you can tell, I only think about the judge. <laughs> I don't think about mom or dad. I think about what the judge is experiencing through during my presentation. That gives the judge an opportunity to just sit back and think and consider what's in the best interest of this minor child based on their history. And also, I don't know about you, Charles and, and Rebecca uh, and Dan, nine times out of 10, a judge who feels comfortable with an expert, they're able to then ask all of their curious questions about what they may not know about the disability. And so you have a judge that then is informed um, and is also empowered and feels competent in their decision because they're, they're getting it from a, a professional. So experts, they cost, but the cost is relative to the experience that the judge is going to have and, and, their ability to make a decision, um, not based on the back and forth between the parties. You know, right. I, I think <laughs> it's like you're I love it. it's all about it's like yeah. a candy shop. These are the things that really change, you know, a, a case. Yeah, it's all about delivering the value, which is yeah. what you were talking about, delivering the value to the client. Um, how delivering it to the judge by yeah. always remembering who matters. I care about what the judge feels and thinks more than I care about what you feel and think. And if you don't, if you don't like that, I'm not your person because we're not going to be embarrassed over here. Right. And so for our listeners, it sounds like some of the advice here is waiting, right? Making a plan and waiting before we file, um, mm -hmm. give the other side the rope to hang themselves with, <laughs> um, get an expert involved, right? Early, early and often. Mm -hmm. Um, what about going through mediation? We've talked a lot about preparing for litigation and being in front of a judge. How successful do you see these cases going in mediation? So I'm at 90% of my cases set, right? Um, when we talk about litigation, we have to talk about it because the decision stays in our client's hands, right? As far as if we're going to litigate or if we're going to settle the case. But with 90% of cases settling, they settle through either attorney by attorney mediation or court order mediation that I'm sure every state has. I'm sure Virginia has court right. mediation. Um, and that process looks like being, I, I pride myself in being the party that has information as soon as possible in the case so that my client can make an informed decision about their settlement position and what they're willing to offer and what the reality of the situation is. When I think about mediation and settling, I think about number one, being um, armed with information to understand what are the pros and cons of settling and what are the reasonable ranges of settlement, right? Um, and what is actually going to allow you to move forward in your life with a settlement offer that works for you and your children um, long-term. And so, again, mediation is something that 90% of cases settle. I believe in being prepared early, having information early, 
Uh, I don't believe in waiting for information from the other side. I'm a subpoena girl. As soon as I send out my discovery, 35 days. We do 35 days after we send we send out those subpoenas. Um, but once we have that information and you are informed, I'm going to tell you what I think the court's going to do. And with that information, um, if you believe that the court may feel something different or if you need more time to think about it, I respect that because these are some of the hardest decisions that you're ever going to make in your life, right? Um, but after that, it's being informed um, and then going to that settlement table. The one, the number one reason I would tell someone not to settle is when I, you know, the fraud tri triangle, right? When I see that someone is being fraudulent, when I see someone is um, not being forthcoming with what they actually want. So it's not a fault of theirs, but one second they want this, one second they want that. That's a waste of your time, right? Let's just go ahead and get ready for a trial. I don't want to utilize funds and we could be, we could be getting ready for a hearing doing a deposition, but someone is hiding behind mediation or settlement. Um, and I don't stop preparing my case, right? Because even if I'm going <laughs> to, I know Charles, right? Um, even if I'm going to settle or mediate, I need to be prepared for that settle, settlement and mediation. Um, I need to be in the best position that my settlement offer um, is one that is the most powerful um, offer in the room because it is backed up with facts, right? Um, not what your income may be, or what, you know, I made around 150,000, well, with bonuses and with fringe benefits, the records show that you're at 215,000. So, you know, there are some reasons why I don't like mediating. And, and, cause this is, this has occurred a lot in the last few months. If I have a practitioner on the other side who is known to, um, use mediation as a discovery tactic. And, and I can get into that a little bit. Um, I, I kind of mentioned a little bit earlier, which is they, they're not going to do the work. They're not going to do the discovery. They're not really going to litigate, right? And get everything prepared for trial. Uh, and they want to use the settlement conversation to thwart their responsibility to provide discovery and to provide responses or, you know, or to thwart uh, a deposition, right? Uh, with their interrogatory answers or their discovery responses not being um, substantive, um, we're not we're not doing mediation, right? Um, so again, that is trusting the professional in the room um, to do what's best for you. When the other side is saying, "Hey, let's mediate. We can settle." My my attorney saying we can settle. Um, you need to look at how this is going to affect your case as well. Yeah, I love that you brought it up. If you're not being forthcoming and I can't be prepared to fight for you, then I'm not wasting your money on mediation. I'm just right. going to continue forward with the trial. I'm going to continue forward with my motions to compel. I'm going to continue forward being you know, aggressive for your rights, uh, friends with the other side. So Josephine, I want to thank you for taking the time to join us today. Um, you know, it's always awesome to get to talk to, to you it's, and get to talk and, and hear your passion about, you know, actually helping people through the divorce process in, in a more, um, I, I don't want to say intelligent, but I do believe getting away from the emotion of divorce and thinking more about the, the you know, the ins and the nuts and bolts is what's important to the divorce. It's hard not to be emotional to divorce. It's hard not to be emotional when you're talking about your children. So if you like this, please click like or subscribe, and we look forward to talking to you next time. Thank you for tuning in to our podcast. If you found this episode helpful and you want more informational content, please be sure to subscribe and join us on all major social media platforms, including YouTube. Stay connected for more exciting updates and tips.